the market and we'll get further press from that and there'll be further pressure. Um, in fact, you've probably got the idea, I'm quite happy to engage with the media in the, you know, let them do the sensationalist things that actually you know, help what we're doing. So I mean, I've quite pointedly called it the bat phone. Um, notionally because it's based on Batman, but um, I'm also fully aware that it's a win-win situation. Either it has the cultural reference that people go, oh, you know, bat phone, that gets you from A to B guaranteed. Um, you know, ideally under the, the nice you know, cheese cover with the, the red phone with the blinking light. Um, or uh, we get our butts sued off by um, DC Comics or whoever owns the copyright on that, in which case we then go to the media and say that you know, DC Comics are being party pictures and messing up disaster relief and, you know, and then there'll, there'll be a, a noisy uh, reversal and, you know... I see somebody right Exactly. Have you shown more games to the iPhone or is that just a future? Future, uh, future yeah. Uh, but once we do it in user land, then it becomes very easy to port it to iPhone uh, without needing to um, you know, jailbreak your phone even. So it would just be a, a conventional network thing until they pull it from the, um, yeah. um, the market. Sure. I, th I, think, I think the problem to port it for the iPhone officially will be that Apple changed their policy some time ago and you must not use uh, computer languages except Objective-C, JavaScript mm -hmm. and I think there's a third one. So and it's not allowed to cross compile stuff into this language. So sure. you would have to reprogram all stuff, including the routing protocol, yeah. for the iPhone itself. And that's pretty annoying. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's annoying. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've coded in objectionable C before. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's work, but it's not insurmountable. I mean, if, you know, a good person working on it for a year would easily have that done. Um, and I think, you know, I'm. My funding strategy is actually quite cheeky. I'm asking as many organisations as I can for money to do exactly the same work. Um, and I've been quite upfront with them saying that this is what I'm doing. You will get what you're paying for, but the more that I can get from other people, the more you will get for what you've paid for. Um, Quicker. Yes, that's right, faster and shinier and all of those sorts of things. Steve. Where's your oh, funding to, plea? To, oh, sorry. Is your funding plea on, on the website? Um, we're, we're in the process, we've, we've got ourselves incorporated about two weeks ago, so we're going to put the PayPal donate button up and all of that kind of thing, but there's the whole challenge of while we don't have any time, we don't have any money, we're getting to do those things, so there's, and, but we're very aware that we need to. What's your bank account though? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy, to, I'll give you my, uh, my PayPal account, anyone yeah. that wants to um, put something in. Yeah, yeah, I'll put a few bob in. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Can you give us like an order of magnitude? And like, is this a thousand dollar problem, a ten thousand dollar problem, a hundred thousand dollar problem? Um, if I was going to government, and I mean, yeah. anyone here that has contacts, for example, in Homeland Security, so again, I think like our spooks, I think they will see value in it. Um, you know, please, you know, I'm quite happy to have, you know, I've got a separate set of slides that are for the, uh, the more government and carrier and funder kind of um, body. Um, I, I think. The core work could be done easily under a million dollars. Um, but you know, ten thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, anywhere in that range will convince the university that funding will be forthcoming and that will then free my time up. Because I think if I can get my time freed up for a year, that, that will free you know enable me to seek funding from other places to make this happen. And you'll be able, you'll be able to plug everything in. Exactly. Paul, a question though. Sure. To what extent is two point four gigahertz uh, the end game or a way station, right? Because, I mean, let's, let's be realistic in terms of what people's expectations are mm -hmm. in terms of using a mobile handset and what their experience is yep. uh, going to be using 2.4 gigahertz in, in a wireless fashion that they, when they, you know, that you, you actually, I mean, you do actually need to stand still, right? It's not, a, it's mm -hmm. not, not realistically a mobile. Uh, <coughs> not at car speeds. At walking speed, it actually works. In a, a low noise situation, it actually works quite fine. So. One of them you found in the outback, and I'm not sure how much you found it in South Africa as well, but you can actually get you know, surprisingly long links that are surprisingly stable. You, know, you can turn around and do all sorts of things. I mean, if you hide behind a tree, it's still bad. But the problem with 2.4 is an especially urban problem. And as you move out of that, whether it's into disaster relief where there's no infrastructure and no noise, or you move into very open spaces, it does get better. But 2.4 is not what we see as the end point. Um, I think it will always have a place. What 2.4 is especially good for is that I mean, we started like less than six months ago and sort of took, sat down and thought, okay, what are all the ingredients we need to demonstrate that this is an entirely feasible thing? 
and 2.4 was simply the easiest way to get into that. Yeah. Well, the brilliant thing is it's a hack that you can do mm. it with what you have on board of the film, and it's uh, popular to get it everywhere. And in the outback, uh, it doesn't matter if it's 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. Actually, you don't have the advantage of 5 gigahertz in that environment. Mm. I'm thinking the other direction. Yeah. Heading down. Yeah. Yeah, it would, would be cool. Or even 430 or 450. Yeah, that's right. Because the power efficiency for the phone will actually be much better. Even if the, I mean, the propagation characteristics are, you know, it does get better as you head down to some extent. But the main issue is that the efficiency of the radio, for very small radio, uh, can improve substantially as you get down into UHF from microwave. Um, but also, even at 2.4 gigahertz, you know, if I had infinite money, uh, what I would do, I'd actually you know, go to one of the Wi-Fi chip vendors and say, I want to make a version of your chip that also has support for um, multi-channel, very low bit rate. Um, so David Rowe, who did a lot of the design work, is working on his um, new open source uh, voice codec at the moment. Um, and he's expecting, I think by the end of the year, to hear something that is below 2400 bits per second that has similar quality to um, the 729 codec. Um, and I've, I've listened to some samples of it, and I've, you know, it's absolutely oh, heading that way. Um, about about okay. Yeah, so I, I think he's, yeah, somewhere around 2 kbit is what he's expecting. Because um, at that rate, if you use, say, I don't know, like a, a 4 or 8 bits per board, you can get a single rate below 1 kilohertz, which means that it, you know, compared to, um, to 2 megabit, uh, 2.4 gigabit, it's got 1,000 times the energy per bit, which means that it's going to give you, you know, 20, 30, 40 dB um, advantage over conventional 2.4 gigahertz. And in fact, the symbol rate will be longer than a Wi-Fi packet, which means that if you're sending out a Wi-Fi packet at the same time, it will see you know, the single symbol going through as effectively constant background, so it will be much easier to, um, to work around. So each will see the other as probably just a, a few dB of noise, because uh, they're working at such different time scales. But I mean, that's the whole part of things that would have to be proved in that. And, um, as David himself has said, it's probably two or three PhDs in that. But I think that would be a tremendously exciting thing to do because then you would have a very good voice transport that would do, you know, in an urban setting, perhaps a kilometre. Um, I mean, also, I mean, 900 megs could do probably about a kilometre in urban settings as well. Again, particularly if you do that low bit rate using, say, a 5 megahertz wide channel with a 915 band, um, you know, you're going to have very good propagation um, characteristics and signal margin. Uh, you should talk to Ateros, and Ateros should talk to you because they make their chipsets for mobile phones and they have, okay. they have XR extended range. I've told you that. Yeah, that's right, yeah, the, the low bit rate, so yeah, they already have some experience. The mesh potato supports it actually, but uh, okay. for, for master and client mode, yeah. it's not uh, working in at home, as far as I know. Um, mm. The other question I wanted to ask is uh, how far did you get from uh, two of these Android phones? Um, so we haven't. When we're in the outback, we actually didn't, ironically didn't have time to, um, to do a full range measurement because, um, as I said, last year was a media circus, but at home, um, about 200 metres. Okay. Um, and so and that's with all of the signal noise. I mean, you know, my 802.11n was blaring in the house and we were just kind of out on the street. It would be interesting to know what the range of free space. Mm. And of course, it would be better from a phone to a mesh potato if you're doing you know, hybrid that's networks. And in fact, I mean, for disaster relief, probably if we were airdropping, we actually wouldn't airdrop to the ground. You'd actually you'd drop them out with a weather balloon and you'd have it float around over the disaster zones that you've got amazing line of sight um, down into things. And particularly if people are in rubble and that kind of thing, where at any near horizontal distend with angle, you're actually going to have enormous amounts of concrete to get through to them. But from above, chances are you have um, you know, much better scope to get the signal through. And actually, in fact, the um, one of the other organisations that expressed some interest, actually, when we're doing the filming for not this TV piece, but another thing that's coming out um, in a few weeks' time, we're kind of this side of rubble that they use for training our fire services and search and rescue services, and they're like, oh, would it work underground? And they're like, well, actually, so they asked, how much concrete would it go through? And I said, no, 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 it won't go through concrete, it'll go around concrete. So, you know, they've got what they call their, their phobia tunnel, which, you know, you lift it up and think, oh, this is one of those, you know, big drainage breaks that goes down, but it goes down, you know, about 30 centimetres, and this is this 30 centimetre gap that then goes 15 metres under this rubble pile um, to train them. And so I'm keen, as soon as I can uh, get out there to, um, to do a test in there, again, we'll get the film crews out and show us, you know, cramped in under all this concrete, you know, calling through saying, oh, you know, yes, you know, we, we've reached such and such, you know, we're going to need, you know, whatever. I mean, you make up the, the happy dialogue to, to paint the picture. But I think 
I'm keen to, to do as many of these, you know, they're somewhat hyperbolic demonstrations, but I think they're actually very good for showing not just what we can do with the back phone, but really what mesh networking can do in general and to really provide clear indications. I mean, when you talk about emergency relief and disaster response and bushfires and all of these sorts of things, they're things that have value to politicians with constituents. Just, uh, I'm just smiling to myself because uh, once people pick up the concept of distributed network, there's a chance to find it really cool and uh, amazing. Mm. And it, yeah, it's just it's going to be very exciting. Um, I've just I've still got a, a couple of slides here that we can flick through. This is um, probably the next most important thing that we're very keen to do. Um, because we keep talking, you know, whether it's to Red Cross New Zealand or other places that are, are very keen to use it in disaster response. Um, satellite uplink and downlinks cost a ridiculous amount per megabyte if you want an always on service. Um, and SIP, about a kilobyte a, a minute, you know, by the time you have you know, your registration notifications and everything bouncing back and forth in glorious plain text. So it doesn't sound like much, but when you're paying, you know, say, five euros a megabyte, it ends up per phone at the other end of the link. You know, it's going to be you know, five, eight, ten euros per phone. So if you have, say, you know, you're the Red Cross and you have a field hospital set up in a disaster zone, you might have you know, 10 or 100 medical staff, that would be ideal for them to have mobile phones that they can use. But, you know, are you going to pay, you know, 800 or 1,000 euros a day in wasted satellite traffic? In actual fact, the satellite link is going to get clogged very rapidly uh, by the idle traffic. You're not actually going to be able to get any calls through. Um, you know, this is a significant issue. So, with DNA, we can actually terminate the network on either side of the link. So locally on the network, you say, I want to ring such and such a number. And if a local node responds, then the gateway node goes, okay, I actually don't need to send anything at all over the satellite link. Because the call just gets handled completely locally. But the satellite link is there, so if it's not reachable on the network, um, it can then actually go over the satellite to the other side. And the other side can then actually do the broadcast polling and collection and um, all of that kind of data intensive work where it's cheap on the, in the cloud. And we can go, okay, yep, it's this IP address, this number, you know, and then feed that back through. So you have, you know, to ring a number or to send an SMS over the link is going to be probably less than a kilobyte. Um, so, you know, be a, a few cents to do that. So in actual fact, we could actually offer an SMS service for about the same price as what typical carriers um, charge. But there's enough margin that, you know, you could get a, um, a service where you, know, you pay a few cents per SMS in bulk on the, um, the PSDN network. And you can then actually absorb the satellite link cost and still just charge what the normal rate would be at the other end. So again, for uh, remote developing communities, this is particularly compelling. Um, the other thing that um, we've been talking particularly with David Rowe about is actually the idea of doing um, store and forward voicemail. Because um, if you're, particularly with David's new codec he's working on, you go, you know, you know what is it, about 300 bytes per second is all the audio you need. But if you're sending that every 20 milliseconds, you're going to have I think we worked out it was like 18 bytes of data in every packet, which is going to be about 110 bytes by the time you've got all the encapsulation. It's grossly inefficient. You'd end up with a call rate of, say, three or four dollars a minute. But if you were to actually aggregate that together into a, you know, like a voicemail style thing, I mean, in a one and a half K packet, you can actually have five seconds of audio, and it's going to cost only a few cents to forward that over the satellite link. So you trade off full duplex, which on a satellite phone is actually atrocious anyway, because you sit there and you wait for the the thing to clear um, before you then talk, because otherwise you're talking over the top of each other and it gets very confusing with the latency. Um, so you just go, okay, we'll just have voicemail that delivers near instantly and you know, maybe like a push-to-talk style system. You know, the whole scope of um, exploring that. But you could get, even if you're paying um, five euros a megabyte, you'd end up with a call rate of maybe you know, 50, or second euro, 50 or 60 euro cents a minute uh, for satellite comms. And that becomes a, a much more feasible thing, I and mean, you could then actually have, you know, if you're doing remote health outreach in your development community, you could have a satellite link, knowing that when no calls are going over it, it doesn't cost anything. And if you can control both ends of the links so that you don't have, um, you know, um, stray worms and things hitting the IP address, which it turns out is actually quite easy to organise with satellite links um, to control both ends, then you can actually end up with a, a very um, cost-effective solution. So that's something that we're, we're quite excited about pursuing. 
Um, and of course, you know, the continual move um, towards you know, whether we're using uh, Wi-Fi um, you know, with low-speed air interfaces, um, or even you know, something that we've talked about at the, the spectrum hacking thing that we've been thinking about as well, in terms of um, not just white space, but it might be that you know, in a particular area, you can buy some spectrum that the software-defined radio can talk on, and then you actually have a method where you send out science certificates onto the mesh, and that gets spread by the mesh itself. So you actually only have to carry one phone in that knows it that can talk for that period of time at that power level of that band. And then that's enabled for the mesh to use uh, for better interconnection. Um, and, but again, it doesn't need any supporting infrastructure to do it. Um, and if someone you know, hacked the certificate so that all the phones thought they could talk on some unused bands, um, yeah, that would be a, an unfortunate piece of civil disobedience that would help an awful lot of people. Um, and yeah, the measurable phone tower, so we're basically just extending it to having the, you know, an open BTS unit instead of a single handset uh, tied in. And one of the, the things that's really been uh, quite encouraging in this process is actually that all of the bits and pieces that we need to do this all exist. There is no technical risk and we were very pointed about making this demonstration that any perceived technical risk that remained, we have actually dealt with. Um, we may not have a final solution, the power management may not be ideal, um, you know, the, the codex we're using may not be ideal, the whole pile of things are not ideal, but we now have a starting point in every capability that's required and in the integration work that we can just build on implementing them without risk, um, which I'm hoping will make it much easier to, uh, uh, to get the funding. Um, and this issue of getting access to GSM uh, radio spectrum has been, uh, I think, something that we probably all, or many of us have been frustrated with uh, from time to time. Now, I have done some d uh, digging around and kind of, even before the discussions yesterday, was thinking about the idea of trying to find you know, a location that's convenient enough to work in, that if you like is a spectrum reserve, so that you can go and hunt in, un you know, in wild, uncharted spectrum and you know, develop all of these um, things. With, yeah, it's a bit hard to get a, you know, a pizza late at night when you're hacking on the moon, that's the problem. Um, the, the, uh, the delivery latency is a bit bad. Um, so, a little bit of hunting around. And uh, Norfolk Island is an Australian external territory, about two hours off the coast of Sydney. 35 square kilometres of land, it has nice volcanic peaks and flat bits and forests and open country. Um, it has a population of about 2,100 people and its economy is a complete basket case. Um, and we can license, I've inquired with the Australian Spectrum Licensing Commission, $505 a year, we can have 10 megahertz of spectrum, 505 down. <laughs> and, you know, it's certainly thinking about, I mean, that's a good start, but, you know, whether it's worth lobbying, because um, we actually have, I spoke to the, um, the telecommunications minister on the island, um, paying $3 a minute to call the island because of, um, you know, uh, telecom monopolies, um, and they're really supportive of the idea because their economy is a basket case. Um, like the only um, real benefit they have is a postal arbitrage. You can post to the island at local Australian postage rates. Um, but you know they've tried growing bananas, and then you know they grow bananas on the mainland, and so now they can't sell bananas. They've tried growing passion fruit. They've tried doing tourism, but um, it gets quite cloudy there, and the runway is up in the by the mountains, so you need big aeroplanes with all the right doodads to, uh, to land reliably. Uh, which means that the Air New Zealand do really well, but Qantas actually do shockingly badly. Uh, because Air New Zealand, if they couldn't land in Falk, they didn't get a plane off the ground ever. Um, but nonetheless, it, it strikes me that it's a... Um, so actually uh, the place. next location for the next world summit. Well, <laughs> they, they would love us if we did that. 